All right, well, that sounds good. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to mute everyone's microphone. Chris, I'm going to I'm going to open up your microphone. And then uh, if we want to let other people talk or even share the screen can do. Uh, but what we'll, what what we'll have is a real interactive session. So, Chris, just jump right in. Step on my lines. When I am going off the rails or missing something, just hop right in. And also my colleague Steve Koji will also be on the line and we'll have his mic open as well. So first, let me. I'm just going to mute everybody and then I'll, I'll open you two guys up. All right. All right, Chris, so we are ready, and it looks like we actually have a pretty good turnout tonight. So the the way that a good way to communicate will be for everyone to type messages into the chat box. Do you see the chat box in your little control window for GoToMeeting? If anyone doesn't see it, type, type in a note that they don't see it. No, just, just kidding. I, I okay. It looks like it looks like go frogs. <laughs> uh, looks like people are, are seeing that. So what would be good is Chris, if you monitor that chat box, I'll be so busy talking, I'll I'll have a hard time breathing at the same time. But Chris and Steve, if, you know, monitor that chat box and then j jump right in when there's a point to be made that I have missed or if I'm driving off the rails. Okay. All right. Uh, good, good evening, everyone, and welcome to SCM Globe and the wonderful world of supply chain modeling and simulation. We have worked long and hard, and uh, we've had some success due to the feedback that we get from students and instructors who have been using this for going on five years now. I hope that what you'll see is the user interface is pretty intuitive and that in about 15 minutes, you're going to go, OK, Mike, I got it. I see what's happening. And then at that point, start asking me really specific questions. And then we'll also go into a little bit more detail on some of the things that Chris mentioned. And Chris, absolutely jump right in when, when you feel it's necessary. I'm also going to record this. So not that I want anyone ever. We've noticed no one ever looks at an hour long recording after the fact. You have to be there. It's like a live concert. But anyway. Mike, real quick on that, um, I didn't realize I actually have a student ask me about um, if it would be available recording. So yes, something that you can make available to me. That yeah, I, I will. Tomorrow morning, I, we'll we'll process this. We'll put up on our YouTube channel, and tomorrow morning, I will send you the link that you can share with all your students. All right. That doesn't mean you can log off, Nile. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what what we have done, and I, I'm assuming that everyone has um, been able to register, log on. If there's any problem there, please type in a type in a message right now, and we'll we'll address that. But otherwise, the next thing is to make sure that you look at the getting started section. You can get at it a couple of different ways. Everything that I'm going to show you can be done a couple of different ways. I'm going to show you one way, but that doesn't mean there are other ways to do it. We've really tried to make this thing so that you can easily find your way around even if you feel a little lost at first. If you click on start here, it's a, it's a great way to, to start. And you will come to the getting started section immediately. You'll notice that you're in our online guide, not in the simulation app itself. But you know you're in the guide because you'll see this black menu bar across the top, which has drop down menus as you mouse over them. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to spend 15 to 30 minutes. The content, the layout, the pictures in the getting started section are again a product of about four years of evolution based on the feedback that we get from folks. We want to get to the point and we want to be clear and we don't want to bore you. We're not claiming that you're going to learn everything that there is to know about simulation and modeling in this getting started section. We are claiming that you will know enough to get started. And then you can always learn more as you need to know as you plunge into the case study. Uh, so 
it really is a matter of, you know, as we're saying here, you conceptually, you draw your supply chain on a map of the world. We leverage Google Maps, so it has all the power of Google Maps. And then it's got our power and logic that we've built on top of it. Everything is about combinations of the four entities, the four supply chain entities that you see here, products, facilities, vehicles, and routes. We always ask people, are we missing something? And seriously, we must be missing something. And we want to hear about that. A lot of people have said, well, time. And actually, time is implicit because the simulations play out over time. So the time dimension is absolutely there. This is not just a snapshot. But something else, we're really interested in hearing your feedback, other things, that, other entities that we may have missed. So you define those entities, and we'll show that in, in a second here. And then you place them on a map as if you were like placing chess pieces on a, on a chess board. Or if you're into you know, the military, uh, they do these massive games, and they're games in name, but not in intent. And they place game pieces, which could be, you could think of as the four entities, on a playing board, which is literally a map of the world. And that is what we are doing here. So these six <clears throat> links, the first one is how to activate or purchase your new account. If you have any questions about that, you can always click on that and you'll get everything we do is illustrated with screenshots. We try to hold the text to a minimum. I apologize if it's too wordy at some point places, but we're always trying to boil away the fat. And then these next five links, the video tutorials are three short videos that are about 10 minutes long. And they actually have, if you go through these, or, you know, just kind of hop, skip and jump through these, you're going to know everything. And a lot of people I'm amazed can really just absorb it from watching the videos and they're good to go. I, on the other hand, am a little on the slow side. I like things that are both uh, pictures and text. That's what we've done for the other tutorials here. If you click on the uh, create a new supply chain from scratch, what you'll notice is there is that first video I saw. What am I seeing this again for? But I told you there are many ways to get around here. And then what we've done is we've taken screenshots out of that video and then we've married that up with some short notes. So for instance, when people are hearing impaired or anything like that, this material here is identical exactly the same. And then when you look at some of the others, like the simulation tutorial, same same mode of, of layout, screenshots with a little commentary, red arrows to point out what's important. And then this last one, how to work with case studies, worth your time to check it out. It's really a little bit of words to the wise about how you get started. It's not unusual to feel a little bit overwhelmed when you start. As a matter of fact, that's normal. And it's really just a matter of plunge in. We talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to read it to you because you can read it yourself. But there is some interesting, there are some interesting links here. Uh, the first one is the Cincinnati introduction, which we'll click on in a minute. Another one is analyzing simulation data. We all, already have those links. You can get them in the table of contents. You can also get them in these two, in, in several other screens. But again, worth clicking on those. What I think I'll do is I'll click on one of them, like Cincinnati Seasonings. This is the introduction to Cincinnati Seasonings. This is the case study that far and away people, almost everyone starts with. So we've given it a lot of thought. We've gotten a lot of feedback on this. We think that the information here is accessible and relevant. Again, check it out. We have... Again, sprinkle relevant links in here. And again, you can you can look at this if you haven't already on your own. A lot of interesting stuff. You know, how about making saved copies? We'll, we'll touch on that again. Some interesting notion of it's basically a, it's a narrative. We've broken up into three challenges, and that's the, those are the three challenges that Chris has mentioned. The first thing is make your supply chain run for 30 days. Do whatever you need to do. Don't agonize over the decisions because the point is the simulation will tell you how well your ideas work. So use the power of the simulation. Let the computer do the calculating and you guys do the thinking. And people who say that it should be the other way around, I don't know. I disagree. Anyway. The second challenge is now you've got that puppy to run for 30 days. Get it 
to run for 30 days after you add a couple more facilities. And you're going to get a sense of, oh, yeah, you know, in, in fancy highfalutin terms, you can think of a supply chain as a, a complex adaptive system is the formal term. And you can Google that and get a lot of interesting stuff, at least I think it's interesting. So it's a complex adaptive system. But what that means is when it adapts to one thing and then it, when that situation changes, it must adapt again or it will go off the rails. So that's what we've, we, you'll learn that here. Hey, I had this thing run for three days. I add two more stores. I give it my best shot and boom. You know, the thing won't run. So again, you're going to be iterating through. You'll find out that you can't just think of one thing without thinking of others, especially as you run into the third challenge, which is now keep this whole thing running for 30 days and lower your operating costs and your transportation costs and reduce your on-hand inventory, which is, in a nutshell, what real supply chain managers do every day it's conceptually you know, at least it's an easy thing to say much harder thing to do you will find that out you'll probably experience some frustration in the first week or two and that's okay uh, so mike just real quick um so for those of you that are online and now that we're recording it um this link that he has shown here would be um would be very advantageous for you to actually uh, after tonight use this because it matches up very closely to the assignment that you guys have been given so you have to get through 30 days. Uh, your individual assignments are then to uh, be able to then improve performance over that initial set. And then you'll work in your groups uh, once I give you the, the spots you have to relocate to uh, add, add facilities. And you will be, uh, you'll have to do that. And then one of the ways I'll assess your groups is which group is able to do that with the lowest transportation costs, inventory costs, and operator costs. Right? So this is a great tutorial as well to reflect back on even after uh, after tonight and after you watch the video so thank you mike yes and and to that that whole point about you know there are no right answers but there are better answers there's no question about that and the best answers are those to get your supply chain to run for three days at lowest operating costs lowest transportation cost and lowest on hand inventory so and, and and we'll also show you how you can download a spreadsheet that will let you download your sim, see your simulation data, and you can see for yourself how that works. Uh, you, you start to see that the finance and the operations are two sides of the same coin. Although in, in the real world, we often butt heads. Ops guys are always butting heads with finance guys. Although in my opinion, the finance guys started it. <laughs> but what we're going to do now is we're going to go right ahead. Has, have, has peop have people already been to the library? I'm going to go ahead and log on. Uh, to click back, you'll you just go to the home page. So here, I'm going to log on here. Has everyone uh, been able to log on and go to uh, the the library and load a copy? To go when, once you log on, you come to your account management screen. It has two parts. The the top part has your active supply chain models, and then down below you have what we call save states, which are the saved copies of your model at various points in its evolution. And you can always restore from a save state. You know, if you make a big change, good idea to make a copy of your of your supply chain model before you make that change. Because if the change doesn't work out, we don't have an undo button. And uh, a lot of people have asked for that, and we're working on that. But right now, the best way is save things and then just restore from a save state. All right. So to get to your library, you click on the view library. You'll always find in the upper right corner that's where the navigation buttons are. I'm going to click on View Library. And here are the library, all the cases in the library. Since I seasonings is, is the simplest, although as you'll start to see, hey, simple is a relative word. It will start to be plenty challenging. Uh, these other case studies are everything from um, historical to military to other kinds of commercial supply chains. You're welcome to look at any and all of them as your interest uh, takes you. So. To import a copy of any of these, you click on the import button and you can name it anything you want. Um, you could name it Sensei Seasonings. I'll just call it Mike's Case Study. And we'll save that. So it saves a copy now to my account screen. If I click on here, I can start editing. I always like to just go back and work through my account screen, um, but you could do it any way you want. So there it is. It's Mike's case study. To edit it, I'm going to click on the edit button 
and to simulate. I can click on simulate, but we'll start with edit. And so I'm going to click on that. And I can see that I'm in the edit screen. It tells me that there. And it'll take a moment. It will paint that supply chain its initial state. It will paint it on a map of the world. And then from there, you can start exploring how it's built and how it works. So right away, you'll notice, I'm sure you've already noticed, we have really worked on our user interface. Supply chains live <clears throat> in the real world. They don't actually live in spreadsheets, although a spreadsheet is a good way to capture data about them. But they live in the world. And the closest thing we can find to the real world itself is a pretty good map, which is what we're using here. We're leveraging Google Maps. We can, we can zoom in. You know, we've painted that supply chain. You can see the four entities. Well, I, you, can see, you can see the facility entities. I, I'm zooming in. As we've placed this, this is a model of a supply chain, not a real company, a make-believe company, but nonetheless, pretty realistic. We have placed the facilities in places where they would really be. We don't just have a factory somewhere in Cincinnati, wherever the heck that may be. We have a factory very specifically as I zoom in. And then notice in the upper left corner, I'm going to click on satellite. I see the satellite view. And so you can see this is obviously an industrial area, you know, a lot of parking lots and big flat roofs. You can also see that it is right next to a rail freight yard, which may or may not have some relevance as the case study evolves. And another thing that we'll take a look at is when you, for instance, look at our distribution center. This is pretty standard setup where uh, you probably are reading or hearing in lectures that you always put your, your DC on the outskirts of town because then your trucks don't get caught up in downtown traffic. And a DC is normally placed at a transportation node whatever that is, and here's what that is. You can see this is, there. there is the, the Cincinnati Seasons DC, the icon right there. This is where a bunch of different types of transportation come together. We can see that it is where two highways, there's an intersection of two highways. And again, if I start to zoom in, I can see that there is a rail freight yard. I can see that, wow, there really is in the real world. There are distribution centers, because how do I know that? Well, I know that because there's a heck of a lot of trucks. Look at all those trucks and their their um, their trailers. You can so you can see that. And then we, we look around here, and yeah, this is obviously a chunk of land devoted to storing and moving products. So again, realistic placement of I'll go back to the map view. Realistic placement of facilities. That's part of the gig, um, and now, when I said every supply chain is made of the four entities, this is what I mean. Here they are on the right side. Everything, you'll always be looking to the right, upper right for your navigation buttons. And over on the right, you'll also see. Just real quick, Mike. So uh, those of you that are in class and listening in, uh, the part that Mike just went through where you have the ability to actually you know, engage with the map, you see that the, the lines are drawn, so it actually shows you routing. And when you get through this leg, you'll see that you can change that routing and stuff because that, that placement, the routing, being able to visualize this, I think, is one of the benefits of uh, what I really saw on this tool, and that's why we're using this class, is you can actually have to go in and where instead of doing some center of gravity type of where you put the warehouse, you actually have to go in and look what's that part of the city look like. And so I want you guys to appreciate those factors as well, that type of stuff. So that was one of the things that really drew me to this, and uh, and you'll see even more of the flexibility it provides you when you want to get to the transportation and the routing. All right, Mike. Okay, so, and, and he's absolutely right. And what you'll also find is that the classic supply chain equations that I'm sure you're going to be at least touching on in this course, like uh, central place, you know, where you the center of gravity, where do you put your DC? You want to put it in that place where it's roughly the same, it's equidistant from all the, the other facilities that that DC is serving. Uh, another classic equation is the EOQ, the economic order quantity. Surprise, surprise, if you use the EOQ to calculate your delivery amount to your various facilities, that'll be a really efficient thing to do. And so what you're going to find is the best practices and classic equations that you see in your reading and learn in your lectures will be applicable here and will turn out to provide really good solutions. They won't provide exact answers because even in the real world, as one uh, professor uh, says, the equations will point you in the right direction. 
but it still takes human judgment to fine tune the exact setting. And you'll see that here. So we have the four, the four entities. If we click on spicy cube, there's only one product in this case study, just to keep things simple. We've called it the spicy cube. You can think of it as a collection of the different spices and food seasonings that Cincinnati seasonings makes, and it puts it together in a standard shipping, uh, you know, package like a pallet load or, or a shipping case. It is one cubic meter in size. Again, just to keep the math simple for now, here is its weight, 40 kilos. Here is its price, $1,000. If I, I'm going to close that box. If I want to change anything about this, or if I say, oh, its price isn't, you know, the price has just gone up. It's $1,200. You can change anything you want. I think that you're, you're, the Chris is going to ask you to keep everything, use the default values for now, but later on, uh, you want to make this a little bit more challenging. You can start to do the research, find out more current prices, you know, et cetera, plug in real, more realistic numbers. Uh, I won't click update. That way it won't carry that. If I've made the change. If I click update, it'll keep that in the model. If I just say now nah, exit without changing or updating, we're good. It'll stay that way. The other three uh, entities are right here. If I click on facilities, I see them all here. If I click on them like Fort Wayne, It'll, we bounce the facility so you can you can see where it is as you start to get a bunch of them on the map. And then you, uh, a dialog box opens up and you can see something about it. There are a bunch of default types of facilities. They all come with their own default values as well. We'll just leave things alone at the moment. But you can see demand per day. I can change that. I can say, oh, you know, the demand per day is actually 25. I can, I can make it anything I want, anything that it really is. Here's my on hand. Um, if I click on a facility like the DC where there are vehicles and routes that originate at that facility, we will show you that visually. We've, we really think that the visual element is super important. Columns of numbers don't really speak to me that well. I think only the finest of accountants and engineers can, can look at a column of numbers and hear the music. So we're, we're trying to really paint a picture for you when I clicked on the DC, the, the data in the dialog box, switch to the DC. So again, we can see something about that facility um, are on hand. Note that there is no demand at a warehouse because unless product is actually consumed or sold, there, there is no demand. The demand is at the retail facilities. Products, the product amount on hand will fluctuate and, and be, you know, increased or decreased depending on the trucks that bring product from the factory and then the trucks that pick up product for delivery to the stores. But don't put demand in there because that would be like double counting. Once you've clicked on a facility where there are vehicles and I click on a vehicle, I'll see them all here. And again, when I click on the vehicle, it will show me the route associated with that vehicle. So two goes down to Louisville. Three is going to Indianapolis. Four is a multi-stop route going to Indy, up to Fort Wayne, and then back to the D.C., and truck number one is also going down to Louisville. When I have clicked on a vehicle, then I can see the route, the route singular or routes plural that are attached. And here in this case, there's just one route. It's the Cincy Louisville route. So I can see something about that. I can see its distance. This is a round trip distance number here. The time, again, round trip time, given the speed, we said that 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 uh, truck can run and the speed is not necessarily its top speed. It, it, is, it is modified by a couple things. One is the road, the condition of the road and the amount of traffic. So often you're not driving at top speed on a, you know, a road that needs maintenance or a crowded highway. So, and then you should average in the time where you stop and unload or pick up stuff. So it's an average. This may be a little bit high actually, but we'll just go with that for now. And then I can see that <clears throat> what's happening is it's going to Louisville. It's dropping off, drop quantity there, are 20, dropping off 20 of those uh, spicy cubes. And then when I look at the vehicle itself, the delay between departures is 22 hours. So it runs its route, it comes back to the DC, waits for 22 hours, and then runs again. So we very quickly, and, and you could just repeat this and look at all the other segments in this supply chain. What we're showing you here, and I'm going to click. If I just want to, so my, grow, yeah, go ahead. So just real quick, I, I don't have it pulled up. I'm just following along with you. So if you could 
uh, I just want to highlight some things in that, that uh, the relationships that you just uh, demonstrated there with, uh, between the facilities, vehicles, and routes. Right. And, and pull up the DC real quick. Well, if, if I I'll pull up the, D, the boxes again, or do you want me? Well, yeah, pull up the facilities and then pull up uh, the, the distribution facility. Is that why the I'll ask questions you kind of yeah, yeah. Here I'll I'll click click on the DC so there we can see. Whenever you click on one of the entities, it will open up a dialog box that shows you its current values and allows you to change any of them. So one of the things that um, that you guys will have to that we challenge with is so for example you see that this is a distribution center uh, and so it has a capacity in terms of how much it can hold. And so you can back into that with the, you know, the characteristics of the product in terms of how much product can hold. Uh, and then there's also cost. And so, uh, Mike, if you could just chat to that real quick, the daily rent uh, per the, um, uh, the cubic meter, that $2 is based on the max on the 15,000 storage yes. capacity. Yes. And so if, if you decided to solve a problem, for instance, by adding more storage capacity, well, then obviously your rent will also go up. And you know, so you may need to, but everything everything has uh, you know every action has a reaction. So you cannot. What you'll find is that in solving one problem and thinking maybe too in a in a too focused manner or in a too much narrow manner, you'll solve the problem in one sense, but you'll create a problem somewhere else. Um, so. It makes more sense to talk to someone. As you see, you're only using 27 percent of that space, but you're paying for the full 15,000 yeah. cubic. Uh, Correct. Cubic. So, so you have to. So when you guys are playing with your different facilities and you're understanding, do you really need that much space and those things. Because that's going to be a driver of your costs. So if that makes sense. Um, and then also, and so then you get down. Um, and so then next, the other thing that's really, uh, and Mike talked about it, but I want to make sure you understand is when you get to the vehicles, the vehicles are linked to a facility. So for example. Yes. Uh, if you go, so now you're in the distribution center. When he clicks on vehicles, he click, you have to click on the facility first. So you click on the distribution center. And then what it'll do is it'll open up the facilities that are assigned, uh, the vehicles that are assigned to that facility. And then each one of those, it has its own characteristics. And so, for example, you'll see there, that's a medium truck. If he was to press that drop down menu, then there are other types of transportation. Uh, for hours, we're going to stick primarily to the trucks, just for simplicity. I mean, you could do rail and air and other things, but there are three different types of trucks, which is similar to what we're doing. Talking in transportation, there is a small, a medium, and a large. Each one of those has different volume and weight that it can carry. Uh, each one has different costs and things like that as well. So, uh, so you have facility constraints and capabilities, and you have individual vehicles that are assigned to that facility based on the tasks that you've given them. And so um, as you go through that, each one of those little drop down menus, as you adjust those, will drive efficiency costs and those types of things. And you'll see some of that when he runs, like the first couple of runs, you'll, you'll see some of that play out pretty quickly. And then, sure. then, then he clicks on the truck and then you get the route. And so as he just talked about, the routes are automatically populated. Uh, but you can go in and, and I, I don't, uh, you know what I have to do here, I mean, if you could just show them, like, for example, how they might reroute or change a route if they want to do something like that. Oh, I, I didn't quite hear it. Uh, so if you just go like real, real quickly, like they, for example, if they wanted to change a route, how yeah. they might be able to change a highway or you know, go around and do something different? Yes, there is, and again, we're leveraging a capability in Google Maps to do that. So there's a drag and drop feature. Now, there's also one of the ways that this is designed and one of the constraints is that once you have set a route for a truck or a railroad, it, you can change the stops on the route. You can add or delete stops, and you can change drop quantities, pick up and drop quantities. But the route itself is fixed. If I, and this is one of the things. Let me just show you why it's always a good thing to read the frequently asked questions. If I click on Help, it will open up a, a new tab, and the online guide is there. And if I click on the FAQs. It's both FAQs plus whenever we get a report of a bug and, and um, it's there's always in any any body of code more than 10 lines long there's always a bug and sometimes even less than 10 lines. So uh, if I if I scroll down here one of the bugs and I don't know if it's a bug or not we're gonna it's pretty complex for us uh, but here it is. It's showing you 
what will happen, I'm, and you, I'll click on that screen, give you a bigger picture here. So you can see, when I try to change an existing route, we're using a feature that enables us, you can change routes for airplanes and ships very readily. But with, with trucks and trains, these white globes happen every place there is a curve in the route. And it's just, there's just way too many little white globes to mess with. So if you try to change it after you've done it, you'll get this weird thing where all of a sudden the return route will be a straight line and the going to route will be covered with little white globes and it will be a nightmare. So what we advise in that is to just, if you, you know, to change the route line itself, remove the entire route and recreate it. I know not the most elegant solution, but um, what that means is when you first lay in the route, you can drag and drop. If I go right now, I'll just do that. Let's say I have a second truck. I'm going to make a second truck that will be running to Indianapolis. So, and I want to base it in at the DC. So I'll select the DC because that's where I want to base that vehicle. I could base it at any one of these facilities, but we'll just stick with the DC. And then I'll click on vehicles. It doesn't exist yet, so I'm going to click on new to create anything new. Create uh, that means products, facilities, vehicles, or routes. Click the new button. So I'm going to click the new button, and we're going to call this the new truck. And let's say it's going to be a small truck. Maybe we just need a little bit more up there, for heaven's sakes. Okay, I'll make it a small truck. I'll make its delay between departure, like, say, every 24 hours. And I'm going to click Update. And now I'm going to select that new truck, and I'm going to click on Routes. And there are no routes right now associated with that new truck. So I want, I'm going to click on new to create a new route. And I'm going to call it. I've just learned from experience that there's a lot going on in the model. And just to try to keep things clear in my own mind, I, I always name my, I could name my route, routes Ralph, Ralph 1, 2, and 3. But I'm going to name it the, the starting point and the end point just so I, it makes sense to me. So I'm going to, you know, like we'll, we'll say for, it's the Cincy to, to uh, Indy <coughs> route going from Cincy to Indy. Now, I can send that vehicle to any one of the facilities that I've defined in this uh, model right now. And if I click on the drop-down, there they all are. I want to send it to the Indianapolis store, so I'm going to select that. And then I'm going to click Add Stop to Route. And it will draw what seems to be, I can close some of these, what seems to be the best route. But maybe I know something the computer doesn't, which is actually often the case so I'm going to, and you see that little, that little black draw that says drag to change route. I'm going to, some, sometimes it's a little tricky. But you see how it's, it's moving the route line there? Sometimes you got to control it just so, but this we're leveraging. There we go. Let's make it do that. Now I say, okay, I like that. And, of course, whenever you create a route, you have to assign a product. So we'll, and if there were more than one product in this, you'd see them all there, but there's only one. So we are going to say, uh, let's make it a delivery quantity. We know that the, the, the carry volume is 40, and we, we know that the shipping case is one cubic meter. So we could ship up to, up to 40 if we want to there. If I overload it, it will tell me. Uh, I'm just going to say, well, let's ship. How about 35, 34? You can't, and you can't ship fractions of a, of a pallet because you just can't. So I'm going to click on add. I could also have, and you see, see there's a, I could, I could pick up stuff too. In this case, there's only that, but maybe in another model, I would want to pick up uh, returns or pallets, empty pallets or whatever. So I could pick up, you know, I can pick up other stuff there. But you won't need And while you're there, so um, the reason why I wanted you to mention this is, you know, your second level assignment is going to be supporting new stores and things like that. So you have the flexibility of the routing. Uh, you also, if you'll notice, when you add the truck, it said add another stop. So we've talked about like multiple stops. And so there's a function there where you can add a truck. Uh, you make multiple stops in multiple different locations. And so that's, that's available as well. So when you guys start figuring out how you want to move the product to different stores and things like that, um, Probably stick with existing routes like you suggested for the current when you are trying to service the new cities. You have the flexibility to play with the routes. Uh, and in the Houston scenario, you have the ability to add drops and you can, you can reduce the cost or improve performance by using multi-stop versus individual trucks. And so 
that's all done. The reason why I wanted to show you that is if you wonder like how do you get there, you have to know that I have to go back to the facility and then choose the truck. And so there's that, that relationship. You can't just click on route or come truck. You have to actually go back to what facilities that I did to assign to and then work your way down. Does that make sense? Yeah. I've got two nodding people in the room, so uh, I'm going to run to that. Now, is everyone out there in the uh, listing online? Does that make sense? Does anyone see that? Then once you kind of understand those relationships, then uh, everything else kind of starts moving pretty quickly. All right. Thank you, Mike. It's like they got it. So uh, I'll let you keep moving. Mike, you there? Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Sounds like I hit my mute button for reasons unknown. Okay. So what, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'm going to, I'll just delete this route. You know, when you create things, if I want to delete, you can obviously, you can delete any one of the, the entities. I'm going to go to, well, I'm just going to highlight the route, and I'm going to say, well, actually, you can't have a vehicle that does not have a route assigned to it. If you try, it will give you an error message. You won't be able to run the simulation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here, and this, this new truck right there, I'll highlight that, and then I'm going to, I'm going to click on the Remove button. And I'll say yes, remove it, and it will it will delete the the vehicle plus the routes associated with that vehicle. So that's you know there there you are for adding new any one of the four entities or deleting any one of the four entities. And now I'm going to to see how this runs. I'm going to click on the simulation button. So there it is. I click on that. It'll open up another browser tab, and it will take a moment and paint the supply chain. On a map, and you see it there, and you see you're now you're in the, the simulate screen, or as we call it, the sim screen. And I am going to now right there. It says play. I'm going to click on play, and it will start to play that simulation. And as the days go by, you'll start to get some readout of information here. Now we've deliberately built some pitfalls into this model, so we know that you're most likely going to stumble across all three of them, but then as you come up with your solution, so here's the first one, not enough storage capacity in Fort Wayne, click OK, and sometimes you'll get more than one, but they'll always be, when you, you know, click OK to acknowledge it, you'll always see them listed there on the lower right, and then it will open up a little dialog box to show you what was happening at the moment that that problem occurred, and you can think of this as basically we are, and the reason 30 days is the magic number, is we're working on a 30-day sales and operation planning cycle. Uh, SNOP is the slang in the business. Most companies, at least in public, will say that they use a 30-day SNOP. Some will go for a 60-day SOP. Uh, and many of the many stores now, the, the key is if you can make that SNOP cycle even shorter, you're going to be even more agile. So certainly uh, a lot of the more sophisticated re retailers are working on two-week SNOPs. And, and so what you're doing is you're steering through an uncertain world based on short-term projections. And the reason is that short-term forecasts are usually much more accurate than long-term. And so that's why everyone is sticking with the 30-day, rolling 30-day forecasts. So when I see this, this first problem, I have a couple of things I need to do. And what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start working by flipping back and forth. You see here, I've left my edit screen open. So now here's the model. I can change anything about it to, re to respond to that problem. I see what you could say is a mismatch between supply and demand. And the first one that it found in this 30-day period that we are going to explore is in Fort Wayne, where we have so much product, we can't fit it all into existing storage capacity. There are many ways you could solve this problem. I am going to, as they say, throw money at the problem and come up with a somewhat inelegant solution. But the first, when you look at the, you know, if we go back to the help screen and we look at the Cincinnati Seasonings introduction, what it's saying, the first challenge is do anything you feel you need to do to make it run for three days. Because no matter what you do, you will be learning a lot. You'll learn about the software as well as, and even more importantly, you'll learn about the dynamics of this supply chain. You'll start to form a mental model, and that mental model will become more and more exact, and, and thus your intuition about what to do will become more and more accurate as you play with this 
uh, <clears throat> model. And everything you learn here is equally applicable in the real world. This is not just a game. It's not a toy. It is quite accurate. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the edit screen. My problem occurred in Fort Wayne. I'm going to click on facility Fort Wayne. If I ran out of space, I'm just going to give it more space. So instead of 850, what if I give it, make it 1600 cubic meters? It would be as if I called up my local public warehouse and just said, hey, I have an overflow. I need to, uh, I need more storage space. And that would be done immediately. So now I'm going to click on the update to update that. And I'm going to go back to my SIM screen, click on that tab. And now you'll notice it says reload the supply chain. Uh, this is a cloud-based app, so we don't automatically update from one tab to the other. We do update our servers. When you click reload the supply chain, it's going to reload that su your supply chain model from the SCM Globe servers, which are up in the cloud. Actually, we host on the Amazon Web Services network. And now it says play again, and I'm going to play it again. And you might imagine we've solved one problem, but we might be, we might be headed for another. As, you, as the simulation is playing, you can click on the different uh, facilities. You can see what's going on with them. Uh, you know, we're, we're going down. On hand, it's going down at the D.C. Uh, the Louisville store here, it's uh, going down. Whenever you see the line facing, you know, pointing down, it means we're not delivering enough to keep up with demand. Oh, look at Indy. We're delivering plenty. Uh, and that little stair step pattern means something. I won't get into that right now, but everything means something. And again, at Fort Wayne, you can see we're, we're going up. Okay, we ran out of Spicy Cube in Louisville, and we could have predicted that when we saw this. And there you see, I can see on day seven, boom, we went 20 negative. You know, we, we needed 20 more cubes than what we had on hand. It tells us a little bit about that right there. So I go back to my edit screen. Are you seeing a pattern now in how we're, how we're responding to the simulation and how we're using sim results to modify slash improve the performance of our supply chain. So, and now I, and I, I say to myself, all right, we need to get more product down to Louisville. I know I've got my trucks based at the DC, so I'm going to click on the DC and then I'm going to look at the vehicles. And, you know, as I recall, I'm going to close that DC box. I don't really need that open right now. Uh, I can close the boxes for any of the entities that I'm not directly working on. So sometimes you will want to do that just to keep your screen from getting all cluttered up. I'm going to look. Uh, it was two trucks that ran down there to Louisville. As I recall, it was truck number two. Yep. And it was truck number one. Yep. And the other ones, nope, that wasn't it. That was the multi-stop. And three was running to Indy. So truck number one. Okay. So I got two trucks running down there, and yet I ran out of, uh, of product. What's going on? Okay, truck number uh, two, I can see it's a small truck, carry volume of 40, and, you know, okay. And if, if I look back here on the SIM screen, and I look at the demand, the demand per day is 100 in Louisville. Um, so, okay, I got to, if I look at truck number one, it also is a small truck, also could get, so even if I sent both of them maxed out down there, I would only get 80. I would still be lagging. I could... Hey, I could add another small truck. I could, I could do anything that isn't specifically prohibited. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's make truck number one a big truck instead of a small truck. So I'm going to click on large. Notice now the defaults. All these come with defaults. If I was modeling a real supply chain, I had better numbers. I would type them right in, right over that. But we'll accept the default numbers. I'm going to click update. So now I've updated truck number two to be a large truck. And if I click on truck number two, or wait a minute, was it truck number one that we did that? Yeah. Truck number one here is a large truck. So now if I take a look at the delivery route assigned to that truck, it is only dropping 20. I know it can carry 100, and that's what it needs every day down there in Louisville. So I'm going to make it 100, and I'm going to click update. And again, if I overloaded my truck, we would get error messages, both weight and volume. Uh, you don't have to worry about the weight so much because the you know, spices are, are lightweight. You'll max out the volume first. All right. So now I've, I've done that, and I think to myself, hey, I don't even need that other truck 
because I can handle the whole thing with one big truck. And you know, you could you could leave it there, but now you're going to be delivering too much. So let's just remove that truck and its route and manage our costs a little bit better that way. So I'm going to say, yeah, remove that. So now we just have the three trucks. There's the big one. And then this there's the multi-stop guy, which is a medium. And then there's the large one to Indy, which is also large. All right. I'm going to go back to my SIM screen. I'm going to click on reload that supply chain. And we'll see what happens. Questions, comments? Anyone have questions so far? Any folks that are online? Makes sense. Okay. All right. So now, and you can see we're going back and forth. We're we're chain, we're editing our our supply chain model, and then we're running the sim to see how well it works. And so there's that back and forth. And I can also run the sims faster if I want. I think at first it's a good idea to run them a little bit slower. And I, I'll run this one a little bit slower, just just one more time, because what you're trying to do is you're you're literally and you'll feel your neurons rewiring as you do this. And sometimes it'll give you a headache, I admit. But it's cool because you are going to start building a mental model of all the moving parts in this supply chain, which is something that we humans are actually really good at doing if we practice it and feed our brain good, accurate and timely data. And that's the basis for what we call street smarts or intuition or professional judgment. It's these accurate models. So to, to the extent that you start watching the flow, and if I click on vehicles, for instance, you know, here I can see my vehicle operating costs updating in real time as it, as it runs. My products, look at, I can see where the products are accumulating. Now look at the large numbers, look at the small numbers. Okay, not enough storage capacity in the seasonings factory. Now that's the last of the deliberately planted pitfalls. But by the time you guys get to this point, Depending on the solutions that you chose to solve the first two problems, you will all be starting to, your, the trajectory of your simulations will start to take its own unique path. And we all saw that over the weekend when we were looking at the weather model projections for where the eye of the storm was going to cross over Florida. And it was just a whole a, a spaghetti of different paths. And we kept running the models. You know, the Europeans had their model. We had our model. They generally, though, clumped up in an agreed upon path. Although, of course, that path changed as the situation itself changed. You will see, we use the same logic, although luckily uh, supply chains aren't quite as complicated as weather, but we use the same model, the same math, uh, mathematical approach is being taken here. It, it's called a deterministic non-sequential. So this is not just some mind-bogglingly complex linear equation where you feed in some data and it spits out the data at the other end. This is a model where all four of the entities are defined with a high degree of precision, which is what you just saw when we defined them. And when you place them on the map, the map itself contains data and gives us data. We query the map, we query the Google map, and we get data back from it, such as the, the time, you know, time and distance between uh, the different facilities, etc. So what I can see now is my last problem, not enough storage capacity in the factory. This is similar to another problem, but I'm thinking to myself, hey, wait a minute. Let me take a look. I go back to the SIM screen. We, we leave the SIM screen open because we th there's all the data for you. And we, you know, think about, now you're starting to think about the data. We advise using what is on screen first. You'll notice that whenever the model stops or when you click the stop button, this button right here will appear, export results. And we'll touch on that in a minute. So the, the SIM is generating a lot of data, which you can use, and you can analyze it seven ways from Sunday. We, again, suggest don't dive into the data at first because you will lose sight of the forest for the trees. Um, so first understand the forest, and then you can fine-tune the heck out of it with the data. So what I'm going to do, and that's where the online and the visuals come in, I'm going to, as I click through here, I see my on-hand amounts at my facilities, and I'm forming a model of how does product flow, like water through a network of pipes. What you want is smooth and flat. All right. So at, at the factory, I'm going up, and thus I ran out of space at the factory. At the DC, I'm going down. Why not, instead of just adding more storage capacity to the factory, which I could do, why not instead move more product more quickly between the factory to the DC, 
We want it at the DC anyway. We can see we're not keeping up with the, with, with the products being taken out of the DC to deliver to stores. So we're going to have to solve that problem anyway. Let's do that instead of just adding more to the factory. So what I do, and again, what if, who knows, what should I do right now? Type, someone type into the, 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 the comments, the, the chat box. What should I do now? And we'll just do it. What do you think I should do? Yes. Well, here, I'll give you a hint. I'm going to click on the factory because I know that's where I have, I have my problem. And look at that. There is a truck based at the factory that is shuttling back and forth to the DC moving product. And if I click on the vehicle, I can see there's that factory truck. I click on that. All right, it is a medium-sized truck. It's It's got a total carry volume of 60 cubic meters, or it could, meaning it could carry 60 of those shipping cases. If I look at the route itself, I can see, all right, we're, we're dropping off 30. I'm running every eight hours. It, this is just, you know, a shuttle. I mean, it's, it's taken me, you can see the distance here, round, that's round-trip distance. Round-trip time here is, you know, like what, 20 minutes, a third of an hour. Um, so I'm kind of buzzing back and forth there. Well, maybe what I want to do is I could do any number of things. I could make the delay between departure. Instead of waiting eight hours, I could wait four hours, or I could wait two hours. Um, I could, again, you know, try stuff. If you don't try stuff, you won't really develop that, that mental model, or it'll be kind of one-dimensional model. You'll flesh it out in 3D by trying stuff. I'm just in the interest of time here. I'm just going to say, well, again, we're throwing money at this problem, at least on the, this first pass through, because we will come back and fine tune our solutions. But I'm going to say, let's make that a large truck. <clears throat> so I click on large and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click update. If I don't click update, it doesn't register on the model as being changed yet. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click here. I can see we have a large truck. And instead of just dropping 30, what if I max out that truck? What if I, and, and I, I happen to know, here, let me show you. If I say 200, put 200 in there, click update. It's going to say, now, I, now here's what we're seeing right here, ladies and gentlemen, is common enough, and it happens sometimes in the evening. Our internet, I notice, slows down a bit. You get that endless twirler. We also talk about that in the, the bugs. Well, it's really the frequently asked question. It's not so much a bug. It's a user-friendly feature. We designed it that way. No. I'm kidding. Well, when you see that, don't worry about that. And also, my attitude with computers is give them a little time, but then, you know, all right, enough is enough already. Um, so when that twirler goes on like that, just close the box, click on the, the, the browser refresh. Notice on a Chrome browser, it's in the upper left. It's that curving arrow. It'll just redraw it. Let's, let's take it, and then, then we, it'll re, reestablish, resynchronize the connection with our servers. And we'll take a look at, at where we were on this. So we were at the factory. Where are the vehicles here? We want to change that. We want to make that a large truck. All right, it is large. And now we're going to take a look at the, the route. And, okay, I, I don't want to drop 30. Um, if I tried to overload it, like 200, and, and, I, and I say, you know, it's going to say you, you've overloaded your volume there, okay, um, so I'm going to say no. All right. I, I just, I happen to know that it, it'll hold a hundred and, and it'll show you that if I, if I look here, the carry volume is 110 for that truck, 110 cubic meters. And again, our, our, our shipping crates are just one cubic meter. So I could put 110 on it. Let's just max out the truck. So one, one, oh, drop 110, update that. And now I am going to go to the internet, uh, the, the, the SIM screen. I'm going to click on reload that supply chain. And also we'll, we'll, so we've been running this a little bit more slowly. We've been paying attention. We've been looking for that, that, that flow that you get a, you get a sense of the flow of product. Supply chains are about flow. And I'm going to, now I'm just going to make it run really fast. I'll, I'll go fastest. And now I'm going to click play. And if I, if I pull back a little bit, 
you'll see it's running faster. Um, the model here is actually doing hourly calculations. We aggregate the calculations into 24-hour increments and display them as days, just because all that data would be too much and probably not very useful anyway. So we've aggregated it. But again, you're, you're getting daily readouts of what's happening here. I can see as I mouse over, I can see we're on day 27 now. It's going to run past it. It's going to run a ways. Every supply chain will find a problem eventually if you run it long enough. Um, and so finally, it says we not enough storage capacity at the factory. I'm going to click OK. But mission accomplished. Why? Because, look, we ran it after 35 days. We're good. We solved the first challenge. We got it to run for 30 days without breaking. So there you are. Uh, and then, you know, cha challenge number two, and if I, if I go take a look. So first challenge, get to run through it. We just did that. Thank you very much. Challenge number two, add more stores. Now, we're coming up on the hour, and we can keep going. Chris, it's your call. How much more time? Are we, what do you think? Yeah, so what I wanted to do, um, if you could go back to the uh, just the simulation screen real quick. Yeah. Uh, and so what I, what I wanted to highlight to the folks that are on, and since this is being recorded as well, is that um, when Mike ran through the simulation, uh, he, he highlighted one of the concepts we talked about last class with like, the trade-off between transportation and warehousing. So in each one of those scenarios, he could have done a number of different things there. Uh, and each one of those is going to have different implications for cost and performance. And so that's where you have to make those individual decisions. So your challenge, too, is that you know I, I don't doubt that any of you will be able to get it to run based on this and the tutorial. And so I want to do that's more for self-education. The second piece is then for you to do exactly what he's talking about. Go explore, find ways to improve the performance on the existing model. And then in your groups, I will give you separate, I will give you cities that you have to expand to. Now, if you want to follow along, and you know, if you want to do that other piece of it, it's in there, he's highlighted that it's in there, you can practice doing some other cities, but your individual assignment is to get this to run and then maximize performance. So, Mike, if you could, and, and just a couple of, uh, if you could just show them, so you've shown them the charts, but if you could show them quickly the uh, export results, yes. and then uh, put that into like a uh, you know, financial data. Okay. Export the results, and then I'll show you how to download the spreadsheet template with that will enable you to create monthly profit and loss statements. So whenever the supply chain model halts because it finds an error, or whenever you click on the stop button right there, you'll see this button that says export results to Excel. If you click on that, that button, you can see it downloads, and it, it, we use Excel generically, it downloads a CSV file, which you can then import into any spreadsheet in the world. As far as I know, every spreadsheet in the world can import a CSV file. That's what you have there. If you click on that, now I'm, I've got Excel loaded on my PC. And I'll just open this up a bit. We can see what, what we're downloading. So we ran for 35 days. So by day, by facility, it's showing me, and we've got different kinds of data, which you broke out in different segments. So the first segment shows me on hand. It's the amount of product on hand by day, by facility. There it is. Then if I start to roll down the demand, now in this 30-day forecasting period, we keep demand stable. At some point, we, we certainly have ha had people ask us to make it variable. Uh, in other words, well, we'd it'd be variation around a standard mean, but we won't worry about that. It'll be plenty challenging right the way it is. Uh, same thing goes for factory production. In the real world, factory production would not be necessarily always identical every day, just due to little whatevers. So it would also be variable. But we're keeping it, again, for this 30-day forecast period. We're assuming this, it's steady. And then it's showing me what comes in to every facility. And these are cumulative numbers. So if you want the daily numbers, you just do the subtraction to get that. Now it's showing me what goes out. And what goes out becomes a, a, uh, a marker for sales. Because unless people are just stealing product, <clears throat> when you can look at what goes out from a facility that is defined as a retail location and then multiply that times the price of the, the product plus whatever retail markup you may be putting on there. And there you have total revenue, and then your cost of sales is the cost of the product. So 
Now, what we're also, as we scroll down further, we're showing the uh, facilities cost report, and it's showing, again, cumulative cost for each of the facilities. And you can do the, the subtraction if you want to get your dailies. Now, what we are seeing here also uh, is a bug. We only downloaded the factory truck. We are puzzled. Sometimes it will download all of the facilities, and sometimes it won't. And again, that's always, always, always a great idea to look. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to minimize that. To look at the FAQs, we describe that bug and what to do about it right there. Scroll down to the bug. There's the bug. It's bug number two. Is it bug number? No, it's it's bug number one. And I'll just show you what we do here. It's online here. You know, it's, uh, we didn't download it, and it's kind of I don't know why we didn't. But anyway, the running cost. There it is. There's your total running cost right there. So you can download that number. And we are working on w bugs that are intermittent that don't happen all the time are the most puzzling of all bugs. Any of you working with software will know what we mean when we say that. So anyway, now you have, you've downloaded your simulation data to your own PC. And if I go to the Cincinnati Seasonings case study introduction, at the bottom there is going to be a link. Well, actually, it's going to be in the analyzing data because you're analyzing data when you do this. So analyzing simulation data, and, and again, there's a lot of ways to find this. It's in the table of contents. It's in links. There's a lot of stuff here about how to look at that stuff on screen, what it means. Here's the explanation of what these the slopes and the shapes of the on-hand inventory curves mean. You can check that out. Here is where it talks about downloading your SIM data to a spreadsheet reporting template. And we talk about this because we, you want to just work on 30-day um, periods. So if somebody's supply chain runs for 36 days and someone else's runs for 32 days, you both ran for 30 days. But to compare your results, just trim off the data. And as we're showing here, just, just trim off the data so you, you'll see there. And you know, use the edit, delete, don't just delete. Um, anyway, very. we've spent a lot of time trying to answer people's questions, taking ambiguity out of these explanations. So these explanations are very precise. I know it's a hassle to read some of it, but anyway, do it once and then you'll know forever. And then what you can do is you can download that, import it into this template right here, and you can see it will start to tell you how, how well you're doing and it, it, in a way that the accountants are going to love and a way that is going to get you ops people a little bit of a boost in the eye, eyes of the finance people because we're giving you here, let me maximize that again, we're giving you... <laughs> both performance data, some KPIs, which you're going to want to know about, and we're also giving you the finance, so you get a sense there. I think there was a, a comment. Did someone just have a comment? I was, I saw that flash on the screen. We have someone that has been able to get to run for 32 days, and they're feeling very proud of themselves. Yes, well, you should be. You should be. Take the rest of the day off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And you learned a lot. You learned a lot in doing it. And, and very quickly, we hope, and our, it is our intent, that the software become uh, invisible, transparent, that the software itself not be a challenge to operate, that the, you devote your brain power to solving the problem, not hacking with the software. And we, um, we will say, and this is a little bit of self-congratulatory, so take me with a grain of salt, and yet nonetheless, most supply chain simulations are either of make-believe companies in black box games where you type in numbers and it types a number back, or they are so complex that it will make your head explode and it will take you, you know, two to three years to learn how to use it. And if you don't use it every day, you'll forget. So what we've done here is created a highly accurate model that we hope that you are up and running with, you know, in a matter of a few days, if not sooner, and then you focus your attention on solving the problem, not messing with the software. And anything you can think of to help us make this easier to use, we always want to hear about it. Now, at the bottom right here, we have a link. And this will take you to Google Docs. I'll click on it. And it is, it is a, and sometimes people say, oh, I need the edit, I need edit rights to it. Well, you don't really, because you can just download it. 
like right there, it says download a copy of this spreadsheet to your computer by clicking on file in the top left corner of the screen, then click download as and pick what you want. So there is file. I click file. I go down here and I click download as, and I'm going to download it as an Excel sheet because I'm using Excel, uh, but pretty much anything, you know, you, you can download as Excel and you can open it up inside Google Docs or you can open it up inside Apple Numbers, um, pretty much any spreadsheet will read an Excel format. So this is what it will look like. You know, if I, if I click on it now, it'll open up on. And what we have is you'll notice it's two tabs. The front tab has got all of your macros, the equations. The second tab has the simulation data in it. And you're going to need to cut and paste your own simulation data in here, which is what we explained there. You'll see that in the analyze uh, simulation data uh, sheet on in, in the the online guide. Yeah, I see that. So when you do the export, you get a file like this. You just copy and paste it here, and then the template automatically converts it. So you don't have to do all the individual calculations. And the copy of this is actually posted for everyone on TC Online. So it's in your folder that says um, uh, SEM Globe references and resources. So I put a copy of the spreadsheet in that folder as well. And last but not least, Mike, you need to show them the yeah. save state. Right. So I'm, I'm going to just close that I won't save anything and we won't save anything there either and so the save state and again there's there's links you know how to, how to download and share supply chains there's links everywhere so uh, you know for instance if I look in the it's in the getting started if I look in Cincy seasonings at the bottom of every case study we have a little link as well as multiple other places. I'm going to go down here. I'm going to look for that. Download and share. Download and share. I click on that. Um, and again, everything is illustrated with a screenshot and a little bit of commentary. So it's a three-step process. I'll quickly do it right now. <clears throat> From your edit screen, there's a couple ways you can do it. I'll just do one way. I'm going to click on I'm going to go back to my account. And then right there, to save it, click Save. So I'm going to click the Save button, and it's going to ask me to give it a name. And I'm going to call it, uh, you know, Mike's Week One Solution. And then I could send it to anyone else who has an SCM Globe account, and or I, you know, I could, you can send it in. Uh, I don't, I don't know how how uh, it's going to be working, but sometimes you'll be sending it in to Chris every week. Sometimes you'll be sharing it with other team members, however you may do it. Once I've saved it, I, click, I go down to my save states. It'll be at the bottom of the list. And there it is, Mike's week one solution. And then I could either restore it uh, or I could download that save state. So I'm going to click on download that save state. You, you saw it download. There it is. And now, if I just attach that to an email and send it to whoever needs a copy, they can then download it from the email and, and say I just did that. Say I just got this from one of you. <clears throat> I downloaded it. There it is. I can now upload it to my account. I log into my account. And if I click on that upload save file, I could, I could do a drag and drop or if I can't see it on my browser, I, I click on that. It's going to open up a file directory, and I, I know that it's in my my download folder. So if I click on download, this will take a minute. But there it is, Mike's Week One Solution. If I click on that, it uploaded it. File upload complete. OK. It will then put it into my save state. So I'll say I just got it from somebody else. I'll see it in my save state. There it is. And you can see it's in lowercase. There's my original one was in uppercase. I'm going to click on restore. So I'm going to restore that save file to an active file. And then I'll, I'll see it up here at the bottom of my, my uh, active models. And then if I want to edit it, I click edit. And if I want to run the simulation and see how it works, I click simulate. So, and now I can change it, add to it. You know, maybe you're all building ideas 
uh, you know, I'll say, yeah, that, that's pretty good. And what if we did this to it? And I make my changes and then send it around to everybody else on my team and then other people. So you see where the possibilities are and how you can use this in a collaborative manner. Any questions for the folks that are logged in out there or in class here from, from Mike or Steve, anything else? No, I think that, that covers it. Um, it. Have fun with it. You know, get in there and experiment. Um, it's You can't break it. And uh, if you don't save them, uh, you know, it doesn't, it's, there's no harm. If But uh, do save when you're doing your formal work and uh, keep uh, saving each week is what we recommend so that you can step back easily if you need to. Perfect. Nice to think helpful, I think, and um, we'll get folks up and running quicker given uh, the nature of this class is pretty uh, pretty compressed. So uh, being able to get up and running a little bit faster is very helpful, so I really appreciate it. Good. You're very welcome. And if people have technical problems, there is a support ticket <clears throat> both on the edit screen and the SIM screen. If you look, look to the upper right corner, you'll see that support ticket. If you have a problem, if you click on support ticket, you can tell us a little bit about it. Uh, when especially if you're seeing something and you can't figure out what is going on there, you know, tell us about that. You can also send us an email to info at scmglobe.com and attach, download and attach a copy of your your supply chain model. It downloads as a .json file. We call it a JSON file. So attach your JSON file and send it in. And we'll load it and take a look and see what the heck is going on. You might find something that we have not seen. We have we owe a debt of gratitude to people over these last several years for finding things because they did stuff that we never would have thought of. And boom, there's a bug. We think we're pretty clean right now. Other than and every time we find a bug, we register it in the FAQs, the bug report. So if there are any new bugs that pop up, we will tell everybody about it, and you will see the bug and what to do to, to work around it as we, you know, busy ourselves in fixing that bug. So, um, yeah, there you are. There you are. And, and like Steve said, have fun with it. If you're not having fun with it, uh, one, one, one person said, uh, one of the instructors said, this is like learning the steps to a new dance. And he he's into line dancing and his wife made him do it. But now he loves it. But he said the first couple of weeks, it was awkward as all get out. And he really didn't want to be there. And then all of a sudden something clicked and it was fun. I think you're going to find the same uh, experience here. So we want you to get to the fun part ASAP. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. And I will uh, we'll chat with you again tomorrow in a different group. All righty. Okay. Well, good night, Shannon. So, for the expectations of the. Uh,